Okay, let's get started. So um, welcome to this Kopi community call. Um, we are recording it. We just started the recording, just so everyone's aware of that. Uh, Kopi, which stands for the Coalition of Open Access Policy Institutions, was formed in 2011 to bring together representatives from North American universities with established faculty-led open access policies, and also those in process of developing such policies. So today's event is a collaboration between the coalition, for, between COPE and also the Society Publishers Coalition and Transitioning Society Publications to OA. So all three groups have uh, been involved in um, putting this together. Our topic today is making green open access work for society publishers, a panel discussion. Uh, there's a couple details I wanna go through before um, we actually start. Um, first, if you're not talking, please have your uh, microphone muted. Uh, also, uh, when you're speaking, try to avoid using jargon if possible, and also tell us what acronyms are. Try not to use too many acronyms and be ready to explain what your acronyms or jargon are if you do use them. Also ask questions. Uh, this is a play, this is a, an environment where we're learning from each other. Um, and so feel free to ask questions. Um, for attendees, uh, you can put questions in the chat while um, panelists are speaking um, and, um, and we will get to them in the Q&A section. So there are uh, three sections to the talk. Um, the first section, each panelist will have five minutes to say what they specifically want to say about our topic, and we'll go in alphabetical order by last name. The second section will have the panelists responding to three different questions that were posted in, in the registration page, so everyone knows what they are. Uh, I will ask the question, and then each of the panelists can respond as they wish. And the third section is an open Q&A section with attendees. So any questions that you put in chat will be uh, asked during that open Q&A section. We have five panelists uh, for today's call. Three of the panelists are from society publishers and two are from the library world. Um, uh, so uh, now we're officially starting section one. Um, I will introduce each speaker and then he or she will have five minutes for their initial presentation. So first up is uh, Curtis Brundy. Curtis is the Associate University Librarian for Scholarly Communications and Collections at Iowa State University. And he's a member of the TSPOA Steering Committee. Okay, go ahead, Curtis. All right, thank you, Caroline, and, and thanks for organizing this today. So I wanted to start out because TSPOA is, uh, was part of the collaboration that brought this panel together. I wanted to say just a few words about TSPOA here at the top. Um, this is a group that I co-chair along with Rachel Sandberg from Berkeley and Cameron Name from CERN. Uh, the group was founded two and a half years ago. It's a, it's a grassroots um, scholarly publishing uh, sort of volunteer uh, uh, sort of group. And our the, the goal of the group is to, you know, I, we identified a need, you know, going back that two and a half years ago for um, assisting societies with their open access transitions. And we thought one way to go about that would be to get together some of the folks who, who care about this and to put some resources out into the community. And so what this work usually looks like um, are consultations between members of TSPOA, which uh, Emma is also a member of our group, um, with societies that get in touch with us. And, you know, we don't, we hardly advertise, but societies find their way to us, which I think speaks to the need and the urgency within uh, the, the publishing community, certainly for the societies of uh, trying to find a way forward from the subscription model, you know, to these these new open access models that we're looking at. So my work at Iowa State largely focuses on figuring out how to transition, you know, a, a fairly large subscription budget in the neighborhood of five and a half million dollars over to supporting open access. And we do that through open access agreements. We do that through investments and, in, you know, other open initiatives and open infrastructure. Um, for a, quite a few years, the biggest investment that open, you know, open access that Iowa State made was in the area of green OA. And we still 
are highly staffed with our repository, tracking down versions of articles to get put into the repository. Of course, now we're making OA agreements, we're doing these other things, we're spending more money in other directions, but that's still really important to us. So bringing this around to the, the rights retention strategy from, from Coalition S, I wanna say just a few words about that. Um, I don't actually see this as an end game. You know, I see the rights retention strategy as a way for, in this sort of transition period that, you know, for certainly some publishers and some societies in order to get, you know, compliant. And we, we're seeing that with what, how AAAS is using it, right? They're gonna use the rights retention strategy in order to get those percentage of articles that are coming from these Plan S funders, um, Plan S compliant. And I think that's a great use of it. Another use I think of the rights retention strategy is that it is injecting more uncertainty, more urgency into this move that we need to make to open access. And I think that that could cause some stress in some quarters. I mean, certainly some of the panelists here may feel a little bit of stress from this growing urgency, but coming from a library that does not wanna see another subscription invoice, new fiscal year starts July 1, you know, we do not wanna keep paying subscriptions. We wanna pay for open access. So to the extent that the rights retention strategy is driving more urgency to actually affect this transition, I think it's great. And I know the folks at AAAS are not just stopping with using the rights retention strategy to be plan as compliant. I know that they're looking at uh, ways to take, you know, uh, open an open transition for themselves. And that's the type of work I've been heavily invested in. And that's what TSPOA does. And I think I will stop there. I think we'll get into more of the nuances of this, but, but thanks again. I'm very happy to be here today. Okay. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, next up is Matthew Giampola. He is the vice president of publications at the American Geophysical Union. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Vice President of Publications at AGU. Uh, we're a global society. Uh, well, we were founded in the United States. We see ourselves as a global society covering all Earth and space sciences. Uh, we're founded in um, 1919, but our publications uh, go back to 1896. I know we have a few publishers here that have publications that go back even further than that. But I think it's important to remember that uh, uh, all of these things have been evolving over a long period of time, and now we're in this rapid state of transition. So I, I just wanted to start a little bit with AGU itself. Uh, we recently um, redid our, our strategic plan um, last year. We finalized our new strategic plan for the next five to 10 years. And we have um, we had three real uh, large objectives that, that came out of that uh, the new strategic plan. Um, and I think that uh, all of these will, will resonate with, uh, with this audience. So our first one is while we want to maintain our scientific discovery um, and, and research activities, we really want to accelerate and, uh, and pursue solutions to societal challenges and to have um, all of our outputs be, be relevant to society. Um, the second one is uh, focusing on uh, equity and inclusion um, at, across the board, across uh, all, of our, um, um, all of our publications and all of our programs. Uh, and the third is really partnering um, to, uh, to make these things happen. Uh, so partnering uh, with other societies, uh, with government, with libraries, other institutions um, across the board to, to address again, these societal challenges. So out of the first uh, goal of, uh, of accelerating uh, societal solutions to societal challenges, um, there we really see uh, open science open data uh, and, and open access as being really key uh, parts of this. Uh, if we want our research uh, to, to really affect society and do good, uh, it needs to be available. Um, with that, we're also uh, mindful of, uh, we want uh, equity of access, but we also want equ equity of participation in our, our programs. Uh, so we really need to have a sustainable model for how we support uh, support these programs? How do we balance uh, that openness to also uh, maintaining our programs and being able to include people um, from any region um, from any with any level of funding? Uh, so those are the, the big things happening uh, there. It, it includes all our efforts with open data um, and, um, and really starting to enforce uh, citation of data, uh, sharing of data availability statements, 
um, and, and making sure that authors are doing that, not just suggesting that authors do that. I think we could really um, partner there. Um, also been lining up the dominoes with uh, really converting our, our journals to, to full open access. Um, we, uh, we had a successful conversion um, this past year and we're, we actually have one we're just about to announce for, um, for next year. And then we really are going to, to be doing more and more. Um, in the meantime, uh, we've got uh, our, our preprint server, uh, which is gonna allow for early sharing, but also allows for some of these green open access policies. Um, that, that are being pushed. Uh, so we allow posting of the, of the um, author accepted manuscript under CC by license. Um, and and we, we feel like this is part of that bridge to getting to full open access uh, eventually. Um, and then the, the last thing I just wanted to touch on is uh, under all three of those objectives again, so, so addressing societal challenges, equity, inclusion, and partnership, we really uh, wanna uh, embark on a new focus on community science. Um, and sort of co-creation with communities that are going to, um, to be directing the solutions to their problems, con connecting scientists to that work. Um, so we really believe that there's a lot to be done there, uh, again, with connecting um, these groups and making all of the outputs of, of, of that work open. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Boy, everyone's uh, stopping before their time. Is up. Okay. Uh, James Milne is next. He is the president of publications at the American Chemical Society. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> You've just tempted me to overrun now, you see, so that's maybe an issue. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is James Milne. I'm the president of the American Chemical Society Publications Group. Uh, as a society, we're mission driven. And as you know, we strive to publish the, the most influential journals in science. And we also strive to be the first choice for every researcher. We, we want to really be researcher centric in all we do. And just to paint the picture, we have a portfolio of 76 very influential journals in chemistry, of which 12 of these titles are pure gold open access. And we've spent many years developing systems and processes and back office uh, functionality to enable OA publication with the minimum of fuss. Uh, as I say, we strive to be researcher centric at all time to make it as easy as possible for people to publish with us or publish open access where uh, there are requirements to do so. And that really is helping to drive open access uptake across our portfolio. Uh, in the last few years, we've been seeing 50% growth in open access publications year on year. And this year we're tracking close to about 25% of our articles will be open access. So you can see how over the next few years that could uh, climb and climb. So, the transition to open access is well underway. And ACS Publications is a longtime leader in open science and open access. So we've invested in the likes of Chem Archive, which we initiated and then brought on board four other uh, chemistry societies from the UK, from Germany, Japan, and China uh, to co-host and co-run uh, Chem Archive, which has really hit the ground running. Uh, we've launched SCI Meetings, which is a open access uh, repository for uh, conference material, research data we make available, of course. And then I've mentioned the, the Pure Gold journals, which uh, really support uh, delivery of open access in the chemistry community. So as you can hear, we're fully committed to open science and we're investing with the authors and administrators in this ever-changing and constantly evolving landscape. And maybe it's worth just thinking from our perspective, what are the goals of open access? and to adopt some of the parlance that's been used across this domain by many, uh, many people. It's striving for full and immediate open access to research and having a clear preference for that being the trusted and final version of records so that people can trust the version that people are accessing. So with that segue, I'll just say a few words about green open access, the topic of this meeting. And green open access absolutely has a place in this ecosystem. And it's particularly there for those who seek open access but are unable to raise funds to support publishing activities involved. And ACS fully supports green open access. The one area that we probably do diverge from a number of people is that with zero embargo green open access, we do have real concerns for this. Uh, this is an unfunded route that does not uh, support the transition to open access. In fact, it actively discourages uptake of gold open access to the final version of record 
because when there is a free option available that satisfies much of the requirements being placed on researchers, it's natural that that will become a preference over paying for gold open access. And having an unfunded option where we can see systematic collection, enhancing and distribution of those uh, papers uh, without the opportunity for publishers to really recover the funding and the costs that uh, we put in to the peer review process and the quality control, uh, we can't see a way that this is uh, sustainable in the long term. And as many are aware, ACS, along with 50 other publishers, co-signed a statement indicating this as much, that we could not support this one route to compliance uh, of Plan S, that, which is the zero embargo green open access. Fully support embargoed green open access where it's necessary, uh, but I can see a huge transition happening in gold open access, and it would be a shame if that would stall at this point. So I will end there. Great, thank you, Jim. Okay, fourth is Emma Moles. She is the Publishing Services Librarian at the University of Minnesota. Go ahead, Emma. Hello, great. Um, good morning, or whatever time it is for everyone. Uh, it's, it's nice to be here. Uh, as Carolyn introduced, I'm the Publishing Librarian at Publishing Services Librarian at the University of Minnesota. Um, that role is a little unique for me in which uh, I am also a scholarly society publisher. We at the University of Minnesota Libraries run a publishing program. Uh, we currently published three society publications and we're in the process of on onboarding a fourth publication. Um, I should note that those societies are not necessarily represented on this panel. Um, they are societies that are smaller uh, scholarly societies. They are almost 100% volunteer run, uh, maybe a, a, a partial staff member here or there. You know, they do not have uh, global offices um, and, and their work is important. They publish journals, um, but they're not also a large business entity, which I think is uh, important for all of us to remember that those societies do continue to exist. Um, across those societies, um, including working with faculty on my own campus, um, I've been working with folks who are on societies that still self-publish. Um, so very, very much different from, from an ACS model out there. They're running small, small journals, um, low staff, uh, likely low technology. Um, and then also societies that have, um, you know, contracted with a with a publisher to get their journal out there. So these are uh, societies that are that are working in contract with uh, Wiley, for example, to publish their journals. Um, these societies, I think, represent a little bit different of a voice in this conversation. Um, concerns about uh, open access uh, and publishing open access, um, you know, still continue to be valid. Concerns of right now are journal is able to function because we charge a subscription cost what what happens without that these are tend to be uh societies with very low overhead or, or costs uh and and expenses in general and then also uh faculty members i work with who are being asked by their larger commercial publisher how are you going to transition your publication to open access um that, that's a conversation that when all of the publishing operations have already been sent on to a commercial publisher is really hard for a society to answer i think for us as librarians i, I think there's a real space uh, as curtis mentioned through tspoa to really meet with societies that don't have a good idea of of what their publishing operations are. Um, this is a lot of societies that don't understand the real costs that are involved. Um, and therefore it's hard to uh, try to think about shifting your business model, one from subscription uh, to some model of open access when, when there's really a lot of unknowns at play. Um, I, thinking about the green open access route, uh, at the University of Minnesota, we have an institutional open access policy, um, but it requires full participation from the individual faculty members. The university doesn't take a single action without uh, without the 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 um, the actions of the individual faculty members. Um, so I think you know in, in some conversations we might say that's that's maybe a, a bit of a toothless open access policy, but I do think it is. Uh, important to remember that green open access and self archiving has been around for a while and for some of us we just haven't seen the faculty uptake on uh, leveraging 
those policies. Um, so I think we still have a lot of education to do around green open access on campus. Um, you know, Curtis has a, a nice example of Iowa State of, of staffing uh, green, uh, green services in his libraries. Uh, at my university, we, we're not doing that type of work. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, I, I also think as a, as a librarian perspective and a lot of work that, uh, that I do alongside my library's colleagues are a lot of education around copyright in the first place. Um, I think for some uh, disciplines and as some faculty members as individuals, there has never been a publishing opportunity for them in which they are not transferring their copyright. So even imagining moving into a future in which rights are retained uh, or copyright is retained, that's that's going to be really a mind shift that I'm not sure if everyone is really ready to think about what does that mean um, for me as an individual author. So my perspective is really one of education. Uh, and also, I, I hope to kind of bring back into this conversation, um, you know, some of the concerns of our, our smaller societies that that really um, are facing sort of a, a challenge here for a number of reasons. And one, one being that um, you know, they, they just don't have the publishing uh, insight and experience that many of our larger, older societies have. So thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, and, and happy to continue this conversation today. Thank you, Emma. Okay, our last uh, speaker is Stuart Taylor. He is the publishing director at the Royal Society. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you came here right. I've got two hats actually. I'm also on the Council of the Society Publishers Coalition, which has helped to organize this event. That's 95 uh, scholarly societies who've got together to try and help each other with the transition to open access. So at the Royal Society, we've got 10 journals across the whole range of science. Two of them are fully open access and we're working on making the rest of them open access too. Uh, we started offering open access as an option back in 2006 and now almost half our output is open access. Um, <clears throat> in terms of green open access, publishers tend to get a bit twitchy about the mention of green open access. Um, and as we've already heard from Jim, they say that they don't get paid for it. And that's what the objection is. It's not really strictly true, though, because, of course, they are getting paid subscriptions. They're just not getting paid anything extra for it, which I think is the point. But I think that's kind of the problem with, uh, with green OA as well, which is that it, re it relies on the continued existence of the subscription system. And if that's really the world that we all want, then fine, I guess, but it would be a pity, I think. Um, I mean, the accepted manuscript version is not as rich and useful as a product as the final version. Um, it would only be a sort of gratis OA rather than Libre OA to use Stephen Harnad's terms. Um, and in most cases, it's delayed as well. But if we ever did get to a fully green open access future, if we could imagine that, there's no such thing as a free lunch, so it would require librarians to give some kind of undertaking, presumably, that they'd still subscribe to the journals, which makes green open access possible. Otherwise, there really would be no income and the journals would just disappear. Now, there are people, of course, who might not worry too much about journals ceasing to exist, but I don't think they're in the majority, to be honest. On the other hand, you can see why green open access is a very appealing prospect. If you're a researcher in a poorly funded environment, for various reasons, or an independent researcher, or you're a cash-strapped institutional librarian, it's it's um, you know it's it's appealing from that point of view. I do think, though, it's subject to overclaiming on both sides. Either that it's all we need, and if everything was in a repository, then everything would be fine, which I don't think is really true, or that it's the ultimate danger and threatens to bring the end of the world. I mean, neither of those really, I think, are the case. So I would see it as part of the solution for the time being while we get to a fully open access future, um, which is financially sustainable for journals. And just to be clear, when I say sustainable, I don't mean a future where they all make just as much money as they do now. I mean a future in which they can survive and still do the job the community expects of them. Because journals are a means to an end, let's not forget. They're not an end in themselves. Um, in terms of the effect of green open access on societies, I mean, I, it's not clear to me that green policies have had any effect on scholarly society publishing, um, despite the concerns that we frequently hear from particularly commercial publishers. We've had a zero embargo green open access policy for many years, and we still get high levels of annual subscription renewals. 
Now, of course, it may be that the levels of repository use are too low to deter subscribers, as some have claimed. But even in a world with very high levels of, let's say, zero embargo, except in manuscript deposit, if institutions are unwilling to pay for the version of record with all its added frills and benefits, then you have to ask why publishers would still continue to produce it. Um, anyway, I mean, I think all that describes the present situation. We can't really be sure what effect very high levels of green open access would have because we don't really have those yet. And that's clearly the primary anxiety behind the very negative reaction to the rights retention strategy. Our primary concern about that is that although we allow zero embargo and open access, actually imposing that on everybody would have a chilling effect on institutions um, signing up to deals which help us to deliver open access. So that's my concern, is that it would actually restrict or inhibit our ability to make the transition that we want to make. So I think that's all I want to say. Great, thank you, Stuart. And I apologize for not mentioning that you were also part of the organ one of the sponsoring organizations. Okay, section two for this event uh, involves three questions. I'm going to ask each question and then it's just open to the panelists to respond as you wish. We have up to 10 minutes for each question when uh, conversation has uh, ceased uh, or if we reach the 10 minute mark, I'll move us on to the next question. The first one is, what are your concerns about right, rights retention policies adopted by institutions or funders? So I'll, I'll jump in. There's a little bit of repetition from what I've said and some of the other panelists. So <clears throat> I think the concern is that if you take it to the extreme and there's the question, surely the subscriptions cover the cost of green open access. If you get to a point where let's say 100% of research in a journal is green with zero embargo and it's put in a central repository and marked up and made to look like a journal article, the value of keeping a subscription is very limited because why would you continue with the subscriptions, which we've all heard very expensive under stress within the budget condition, those will be cut and with unsub and other facilities available, that will not just be a, a light switch moment, it'll be a dimmer switch, which could happen fairly rapidly. And that's when you start to cut corners in terms of quality assurance and making sure that the high quality of the peer review is sustained. And that's one of the things that society publishers put at the heart of all we do to make sure that we have the highest quality standards, the excellence in the published content. And I think that's the end point is very concerning, but also it's this uh, disincentivizes going for gold open access. And that's the ultimate goal that I think we're all trying to get to where all articles are made gold open access immediately available with the, the version of record. And I, I think there's a clash here and that's kind of why we're having this webinar, of course. Yeah, could I just could I just chip in? Um, I mean, what Jim's saying there is that I mean, if everything were available on a repository as an accepted manuscript, then the subscriptions would be cut. But the thing that I always grapple with here is that that's publishers essentially admitting that the other stuff they do isn't really worth paying for. I think that's a dangerous argument to make if you're a publisher. Um, you know, why why aren't we just producing the accepted manuscript version and just charging less for it? Uh, I think the peer review is one of the biggest things, the onboarding of manuscripts, the checking of author names when they are when submitted manuscripts come in to make sure they don't come from a paper mill or uh, nefarious places. Yeah, but that's, but that's, that's already happened at the accepted stage, though, that's my point. Yeah. And I'd like to bring back a point that Emma made, which is just about how diverse this world, you know, we're talking about societies as if they are one type and they're so wildly different that it's really hard to talk in generalities about any of this. We just finished our review of our open access agreements for 2020. You know, maybe we've got 10 of these or 11 of these at this point. And it's remarkable to look across, you know, the average APCs that we're paying across those agreements. And it's what's remarkable to me about it not being a publisher is that I assume 
All of them care about peer review. All of them are trying to put out a quality product. But then we can have ACM where we have an average APC of $1,200. We have Wiley where we're averaging $3,000 per APC. And our proposal from ACS to do an OA agreement with you all is close to $5,000. And so I think when we talk about this, it's, it's important to keep in mind that different publishers will be impacted by different you know, ways with something like rights retention. And, and I don't know about if I buy into the idea that you know, mandates coming from funders have uh, should have a chilling effect. I mean, I just, you know, we get, we get, we're under all kinds of regulations and maybe some of those do have a chilling effect, but the reality is that we really haven't put the pedal down with the transition to open access until the funders started coming through with some of these mandates. And instead of a chilling effect, what I see is a lot of excitement and movement actually happening. And will they always get it right? No, I don't think they will. Um, and will they impose things that will have a differential impact? I think, yes, they will. Um, but overall, I think this is positive. And overall, I think the, I don't have concerns about the rights retention strategy. I actually think, I think it will motivate. I think ACS, if you, if you think that, um, I mean, you need to move to open access, right? That's the solution. If you don't like the rights retention, if you don't want zero embargo, then figure out an open access model that's sustainable that libraries like mine can afford. And we've had conversations with you. I mean, and not you in particular, but I mean, we're open to these conversations. We know it's a tough, tough nut to crack and we're, we're here to engage with that conversation. So it's not all on the publishers either. Yeah, and, you know, Curtis, I would I would say too from from another library perspective, and you know, I mentioned this earlier. I I just think you know for us one of the really concerns when we talk about green OA and self archiving is um, it's so much uh, it's 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 pushing that open access work onto an individual faculty member, and I I think we we get kind of uh, lost in the conversation of thinking that every discipline has this really slick archive or repository solution. And that's certainly not the case. When, when we look across all of the disciplines um, that, that we work with, you know, from a library perspective, that's that's not the case. And we have a lot of gaps in education and we have a lot of technology gaps. So, I, you know, I think thinking about green OA as being the solution, that that's always been the problem, right? For, for, at least from my perspective, is that it, it, it pushes that it is something open access to, to making uh, the, the individual faculty member or author find a place to then put their copy, which copy is it? So it's just, it's been such a messy solution this whole time. And, and I do think that, uh, you know, sometimes we get in this conversation of, well, green or gold, um, you know, it, but I don't, I don't necessarily know if, and, and it's certainly not that everything is not happening at the same time, especially when we step out of that coalition S conversation, right? So when I'm thinking about the societies that I'm working in that are very much American based, they tend to be more humanities focused. Coalition S, that that is not really part of their conversation right now. So that that sort of where the, the finish line is and how fast they have to get there is is really working in a completely different uh, in, in a different scale and a different sort of uh, movement in time. So I, I think that's another another issue is that sometimes this uh, you know green or gold and archi uh, uh, societies are sometimes pitched that well here are your, your solutions a self archiving or a gold open access but it's it's such a complicated thing especially for those small societies that really do not understand their publishing operations. And I, I mean, like, I will repeat that because it's such an important thing to understand is that some societies have no idea how their publishing operates. I, I would just echo, it seems a very blunt instrument to me. Um, I think even Curtis, you were saying it's a transitional uh, sort of thing. It's not the ideal endpoint. And it, it just seems, as, as Emma said, it's very messy. Uh, the each author with the rights retention strategy has to go in and sort of request special uh, the, the right to uh, to post uh, their article and retain those rights. Um, and that just adds this whole other layer of complexity that doesn't, doesn't need to be there in the end. I don't think we want it there in the end. We wanna to get to a place where it's sort of a standard thing that everybody gets um, certain expected rights at the end for open access. We have our, uh, the Creative Commons licenses are working. Um, but the but the rights retention strategy, it just adds this extra layer into there, um, and I also think it's kind of unpredictable about well what are what is an author going to do in any given case and what is a library going to do? We know libraries 
uh, are happy when we have green OA policies, when we open things, um, when we open articles after an embargo period, or when we allow posting of, of, of versions of record. But then, of course, they're cash strapped um, uh, and budgets are under pressure, prices are going up. Um, when you have a tool like Unsub around to, to help uh, you figure out what you can cancel and still manage to serve uh, the, the, the people at your institution, um, then you're going to take advantage of those. And that's part of the, that is part of the reason for these policies to begin with, uh, so that people do have access in various ways. Uh, so it just all seems, uh, like I said, a blunt instrument um, and it seems like we could be working together in different ways and, and accelerating our conversations about how institutions and publishers and societies work together to get to open access um, and how, how institutions that are read institutions have people that need access to the material versus people who are publishing, publishing at those institutions. How do we share um, the work and the cost of making a system like that happen? And Matt, I would just, you know, and I, I know, I know you know this, but you know, the, the rights retention strategy isn't the only thing coming out of Coalition S, right? I mean, they've they've prompted multiple strategies. The I don't think the Wiley Open Access Agreement that Iowa State has, which I think your journals are, aren't you all with with Wiley? Yeah, like so we're covering your journals now, open access. And I just don't think an agreement like that would have been possible without all of these different approaches that are coming out of out of Coalition S, I mean, to be honest. Could I just pick up on something I've just seen in the chat from, from Ross Mounts, which is about the copyright retention part of the rights retention strategy. I, I agree this is a distinction here that it's about authors retaining their rights. That doesn't require the rights retention strategy though, because many publishers, including us, do indeed leave the copyright with the authors. Um, and I would suggest further that it's actually who, who, who has the copyright when an article is CC by is kind of irrelevant, to be honest, because the article is open and freely usable by anyone. But I absolutely agree authors should retain copyright. There's, there's no excuse for not doing that under, under any regime, in my opinion. Okay, we've reached the 10 minute mark on that question. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the second question. How can we work together to enact policies that at a minimum don't harm society publishers and that ideally benefit them? Do you want me to go first on that one? I mean, I think there's kind of an implicit assumption there that people don't want to harm society publishers. That's not universally the case. Um, societies there are, there are thousands and thousands of societies, and while I wouldn't in any way want to uh, attack any of them who publish, it, it's not a given that societies all need to be there doing exactly what they're doing today. They have to be able to prove that they're doing a good job and that they're you know, making a worthwhile contribution. I think the, the point about working together is precisely that, it's about working together. I think it's about making sure that we're, we understand that we're on the same side here, at least I, ho I hope we understand that that we're all trying to get to an open access future as soon as we can. That's certainly the case for us. We've recently announced that we're trying to transition our research journals over the next few years. I would like it to happen as soon as possible. And anything that's, that libraries can do to get together with us, sit down and actually thrash out how that'll work and funders as well, obviously. Um, and as I've said, my concern very specifically about the rights retention strategy is that it could be actually retarding our ability to make that transition. Now, I could be wrong about that, but that's my view. Um, but that's quite a detailed point. I think the broader perspective, what funders have been doing in the last two years, I think has massively enhanced and accelerated progress. There's no question about that. I mean, learned societies for many years, or many decades actually, have been thought to be somewhat, um, dare I say, behind the curve on some of this stuff. And I think the Plan S initiative has really galvanized things and made a massive difference. I think that's very well connected. So maybe I'll go next. I'm just trying to recall a slide that we have, uh, I've used before, which is the top strip is, so 
pathways, routes to open access. The first strip is gold open access journals. Clearly, everything published in there is open access from the start. Uh, there's no, no lack of clarity on that. There's the transitional path, which is the second strip, which is the uh, hybrid journals, which uh, are using transformative read and publish arrangements to get us from subscription to pure gold open access uh, at an end point. And that's where working together and, and building these read and publish agreements is a, a major step to get that transition moving forward. The challenge is where you've got research intensive universities and low research intensity universities and trying to balance the, uh, the books in that way going forward. And then green open access is the third strip. So it's very much in the, the third domain there. But uh, working together, it's, it's trying to make sure that we can preserve the quality of the journal and, and try not to do things that uh, take away from the, the quality standards that we can trust the research, because that's the most important thing at the end of the day. And on top of that, how we can work together to make it easy for researchers to line up when there is funding to go open access and making it a single, simple click to gain access uh, means to go to open access. That, that really will make a difference because researchers do not want to spend more time than they need on admin and trying to link up either funding or means to post manuscripts to repositories. They want to, they want to get back to the lab bench to, to do more research uh, or in different disciplines, other things. So the more that we can make it easier for the researcher, the better it is. I guess getting back to, to the question on how we enact policies that don't harm and ideally benefit, I think the real challenge with that is, again, just um, the diversity of, of societies that are out there. I can easily envision a policy that would benefit some societies and harm other societies. I mean, that's just the reality we're under. And so in some ways, the challenge, I think, you know, for those creating policy is to, you know, really target those policies at the world we want to get to and knowing that there are going to be uneven impacts across those policies and and I it, you know what I've been that's something that has been really um, it's made me optimistic about you know this transition we're doing is that in all the conversations I've had over the last you know two to three years with, with publishers and societies like really talking like in, in ways that we did not use to talk is that I think we there is a shared vision on where we are going um, and I think that's a little bit pie in the sky and naive to think then that we're going to just naturally get there but um, we are going to do policies that harm some societies and some that, that benefit. And I just think we have to keep our eyes ahead of us on where it is that we want to go. Um, and I think through the work of groups like TSPOA, where stakeholders can engage with one another directly, we just need to do more of that. <clears throat> like just had Catherine Spiller working there for whatever, like a year and a half working hands-on with societies to try and get them to an open model. You know, she's not doing that anymore. Who's going to pick up that work? Why don't we have a position like that at Lyricist, working directly with societies in the U.S.? We don't have it. It's not something that can be done that easily by, by volunteers. We need to do a lot more um, of that type of work, I feel like, in this community. I was just going to say many societies may, may feel more pressure from this to actually join in, up with a commercial publisher or to band together in, in, in different ways because they're struggling for how they can get from subscriptions to, to the new domain of, of open access. And uh, there, I won't call it unintended consequences. There's just many consequences to um, any given policy that's put out there and, and exactly right. You know, some of the smaller societies that Emma works with um, will, will feel the need to, to get assistance. Um, and it's not a bad thing necessarily. I mean, our, our society is with a, a large commercial publisher. Um, we benefit from that. We push them in some ways and we still have the ability to go elsewhere if we need to at, you know, at any given point. Uh, but other more societies will feel the need to, to have arrangements like that. Yeah, I just saw, 
you know, it's funny as they move under these, the, 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 the bigger publishers, like now I'm getting to where I know who they are because there's not very many of them. So we just had the genetic society uh, move under Oxford. Um, and I think that is a, a, a terrible unintended consequence of all of this. And I think the work that needs to be done with the self-publishing societies is to preserve their independence. I think that's something that's hugely important. Yeah, you know, and, and I don't necessarily th think maybe this would be defined as a policy, but, you know, some, something that I would love to see with the faculty members that I work with um, is more conversation in societies, especially ones that are member based, where, where, where folks are paying a membership due to be a part of that society. And yes, they have a publication, but maybe that's not the sole goal of the society to really have more frank conversations with the faculty members about publishing operations and what it means for our journal and our society. Um, you know, I, I think there needs to be a higher level of transparency across the board and we're, we're just not seeing that. And that, that makes it challenging for us on the library end where we hear from faculty members that say, please, you have to renew the subscription to my society's journal. And then in turn, you know, in turn around that, that faculty member can barely answer anything about why is the society's approach to open access this way? Why haven't they moved forward on anything? So there's there's really a, a lot of uh, sort of very intentionally created silos in this conversation that I think is just burdening everyone a little bit too much. And you know maybe that's more so for the societies that um, that 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 operate slightly on a smaller scale. But I, I would just love to see that uh, more more transparent conversation happening, especially in societies that are membership driven. Any last thoughts on that question before we move on? Okay, we'll move on to question three. And given the conversation on question two, question three may be a bit repetitive. Um, so I'm gonna ask it. And then if there's any thoughts on that, we'll discuss it. And then when that's set, we'll move on to section three of the event. So the third question is, how can librarians help society publishers in their efforts to transition to open access? And um, in this question, I was intentionally not saying just green open access. So um, think about uh, ways that librarians can help society publishers transition to open access in general. Well, I'm going to start with this one because I have a very straightforward pitch, especially for smaller societies. Libraries should become the publishers of smaller societies. We run this function uh, at the University of Minnesota. It works really well. We still uh, we 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 give the society a lot of autonomy. Um, we do charge at the University of Minnesota a small rate um, for publishing fees for societies, um, but they're they're very low. Uh, I think this can be something that could really uh, continue on scholarly publications that otherwise might be in danger of exist of of ceasing to exist or getting scooped up. Uh, by larger commercial publishers that maybe don't have the society's best interest in mind. Um, I, I think we should see more of this. And I think for some societies, that tiny little bump, which financially it is a tiny bump in library budget, um, can really be the make or break for a society. So I'd like to see more libraries, especially libraries with existing publishing programs, getting into the society publishing business. I, I think there's a there's a great opportunity there. It will increase all of our knowledge of, of um, it, will, it will show libraries a greater insight into how societies work and it will show societies a better example of this is how a publishing uh, operation could or should work. So that's, that's sort of my straightforward pitch. I think for anybody who's on the call, who's in a library, um, I'm happy to talk more about that and how to expand your business plan to, to make sure that you can publish society journals. I think if I were to have a stab at this one, um, I mean, the, there's, there's no question, I, I mentioned this before, the overall objective of these policies is very much in line with, with our policies. Um, we've recently made plans to, to transition our hybrid journals, as, as you know. Um, we've got very good relationships around the world with our libraries, um, including with the very first one that had an open access deal, in my memory at least, which was Harvard. Um, and we're actively working with them on how to implement OA policies for their researchers. I mean, I guess the two things would be for me, um, it's, it's around whether they have sufficient funds to be able to support the sorts of deals that we're trying to make with them. 
um, and whether or not they can successfully enough lever, leverage the funds in from research, from research funders. Um, and at the moment, those sorts of streams are a bit disconnected, I would say. And so I guess we want a bit more um, reassurance that they will be available in the future so that we can make the sort of transition we're trying to make, I guess. I'd probably just add it's a slightly different angle, but putting the researcher at the heart of everything we do is, is important, whether we're funders, whether we're publishers, whether we're librarians and the institutes, because it's the researchers at the end of the day that do all this great work and make the discoveries and advance science and society. So it's making sure that we listen to researchers and hear what they would, where they're struggling or where we can help them. And it's something I advocate across ACS, across our staff, to keep listening to this also through our editors, because I saw a note there saying uh, nothing is paid for peer review. Every one of our editors is paid uh, on our area. We also provide support. There is a large cost goes into supporting editors. And they are also our eyes and ears to say, this is where ACS should be heading. This is how you could help the community. This is what you need to be doing in the next year or, or so. So I just say, listen to our co the key and the most important people in this, which is the researchers, who are the people who advance, uh, advance society in that way. I, I would just add that um, I guess we should even think beyond uh, the traditional journals, uh, you know, all, all the open science work we're doing and, and work on open data uh, requires a this complex network of, of institutions and libraries and repositories, uh, societies and, and publishers. And uh, I think we can make all of that work together better uh, so that, you know, so that preprints and data and final published uh, articles and peer review reports and all of those things um, can really be um, linked in a way that, that they're as discoverable and usable as possible. And uh, you know that doesn't solve the financial problem, but it does get at the, the whole point of why we're, why we're all doing this uh, to begin with is because we think that, uh, that science can help the world and we should facilitate people having access to it. And I totally agree with that, Matt. We talk more and more on my campus within the context of open science, open scholarship for all of this. We don't talk about open access as if it exists in a vacuum the way that we might have, you know, five or so years ago. Um, I think there's some things in the U.S. I think that are, are improving. You know, I think we're starting to see U.S. consortium, you know, engaging around open access agreements in a way that will help us scale some of this. You know, a problem that I've realized over the last couple of years is Iowa State has made some of these, you know, what have turned out to be one one off sort of agreements that don't necessarily scale. You know, we really do need to come at this. Um, you know, maybe not, it'll never be at the in the US the way that it is in Europe with the national consortia, but goodness gracious, you know, let's get some agreements running through like the Greater Western Library Alliance through Orbis Cascade, the Big Ten has made their first, you know, OA agreement with Cambridge. And so I think that's a tremendous shift in the landscape that I'm that I makes me a little bit hopeful for all of this. But we have a tremendous amount of work to do. My library publishing operation, it, well, the publishing operation at Iowa State, similar to Minnesota, you know, we're working directly with smaller societies. So that's one piece of it. I think the bigger societies that have resources are probably in a pretty good space to take care of it. Uh, the ACSs, the ACMs, the IEEEs, but that leaves just this middle ground of societies that I think do need some engagement and some support in analyzing, you know, where the money is coming from, what type of model might work. We've got things like the su subscribed open community of practice, you know, a, a society that wants to explore that model can plug into that community. But you know, I still don't think we probably have all the models that we need. So there is a lot of work to be done in this space. And and Catherine did chime in on the chat that she has been replaced at JISC and somebody is picking up her work. So I didn't mean to suggest that JISC is abandoning this, this noble effort that they've been doing. We just need more consortia to do the same. 
I would just follow up on that point, actually. I mean, a year and a half ago, we were we were very sort of despondent, if you like, and rather pessimistic about the prospect of being able to do these sorts of deals. And Catherine at JISC and, and others at other consortia have really um, made life much easier for us in that regard. And in the last year and a half, we've, we've been doing lots of these deals. We've now got about 180 of them worldwide. So it's very different to how I thought it was going to turn out, because initially it just looked like it was going to all be the big commercial players. But Fortunately, um, societies have been able to get a seat at the table too, which is Any last thoughts on this question? Okay, we'll move on to section three then. So section three is questions from the chat from the attendees. And Robin who, Sin, who's one of uh, uh, the COPE organizers, is going to, she's been sifting through the chat and she's going to present questions from attendees. Um, some may be directed to a specific panelist. Um, if it's not directed to a specific panelist, anyone can answer. And even if it is directed to a specific panelist, you can answer once the person it's directed to has answered. So. Robin, go ahead. Hi, everybody. So I've got questions from the chat and questions that people have put into that section of our um, agenda document. We're not going to be able to get through all of these in 30 minutes, but um, I'll try to kind of mush some of the ideas together. Um, there were a couple questions about APCs. Um, there's a variety of APC costs for moving a journal to Gold OA. Um, there were questions about how are those determined, the, the costs, and then the fees that would support the costs of, of your publishing system. And are societies thinking about models that don't include APCs? Why, why do we have to, to go to an, a, you know, a per article kind of cost system? And then there was also that maybe an ancillary thought to this APC question, which was, what about the non-research articles? If you're thinking about how research funders want to support the research, well, what about all the other articles that aren't, that are important to the community of scholars, but aren't research oriented? And you can think about the whole annual reviews as a group of journals, but then also individual articles within journals that also have research articles. So how, how, how can we deal with this whole idea that maybe APCs aren't the way to go? And who's, who's thinking ahead of that game? I'll have a stab at that one. I, I think APCs aren't the way to go for many reasons. I mean, not, that's not just non-research articles. You know, large parts of the world, APCs are not a goer either. And I think some of the conversations seem to make the sort of implicit assumption that open access equals APCs, and it really doesn't clearly. I mean, there are societies doing other things. You mentioned the annual reviews experiment, which is um, also other people are doing that as well, subscribe to open, which essentially takes effectively your existing subscriber base and makes them supporters to allow you to then flip the journal, provided that they undertake to carry on supporting you to do that, which is sounds slightly counterintuitive, but seems to work. Um, whether it's going to work over a longer period, we don't know, it's too early to say. Um, there are other journals that are moving to um, a diamond or launching the diamond model where they are centrally funded, so neither reader nor author pays. Um, and obviously, we've got the experience in South America of open access for, for a long time, which is which is very different to, 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 to the, the APC model. So I think it's very important that we don't get hung up on the APC model because it's clearly not, in any sense, a global solution. I mean, we've got three journals that are largely commissioned content, which are themed, themed issue review type journals. Those are going to be very challenging to transition under an APC kind of concept, even a notional APC kind of concept. So it may well be that subscriptions are going to exist in perpetuity for things like that. I, I, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Yeah, I just endorse that. I think it's a really tough question. The, 
the funding does need to come in to support all the systems processes, editorial boards and so forth. But it's trying to make sure it's equitable, it's fair, it supports uh, flexibility on publication uh, in the journal that you wish to publish in for the community that you wish to have access. And, uh, and I think there will be a mixed model going forward, and that won't be just binary mix subscription or APC, there will be other models uh, played around with. A lot of them are kind of like the subscribe to open, like Stuart says, they're kind of, they're subscriptions, but in a different guise, but it's a creative way of doing something differently to try and uh, help in the long run. So I don't, I don't think anyone has the, uh, the moonshot solution on this, because if it was, if we did, we'd be doing it now. So we're trying to find our way here. And, um, and I think the, the other part here is that if you flipped a switch and every single subscription was a read and publish agreement, and there's the argument that there's enough money in the system to make sure we can get this way. Uh, now, that's a, another discussion point completely, of course. But if you flip the switch that way and uh, moved it in that direction, we would be able to do all open access. But it, that would be like a worldwide subscribe to open transition in that sense because read and publish is kind of a, a subscribe to open uh, stepping stone. I'll just echo that it's it's all extremely complicated and there's a lot of equity issues here, especially for participation from those around the globe, um, from those that are in, in economies that don't have uh, the highest GDPs uh, per capita, uh, you know, APCs are, are not the way to go. and 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 a model that starts out with an APC and then uh, waves for some people is feels like a bit of a Band-Aid on, on the problem. Uh, but, but again, it's, it's all really complicated. We have a review journal that we, you know, we might at some point like to try to uh, make as a subscribe, subscribe to open uh, journal, but uh, would libraries like to do that um, through our publishing partner? Wiley, or would they say, no, we don't want to do that kind of model with a, with a commercial publisher? Um, that's an open question. Uh, that journal also, it could probably work as, a, as an open access journal with, a, with an APC because it turns out in our uh, review journal, a lot of the people are invited and a lot of people have funding for APCs. But that just again brings up these questions of equity because maybe we should be inviting people who, who don't necessarily have a lot of uh, money in their grants to also participate in writing review articles. So, I, um, you know, in Research for Life exists, that, that's again waivers. Again, I think the waivers for, for these APCs are a little bit of a Band-Aid. And I think they're more than a, I mean, beyond a, a Band-Aid, I think they can be demeaning. And it's, you know, we're putting a, a subpopulation of our authors from under-resourced institutions and parts in the world. They have to come hat in hand in order to have a career in order, in order to participate, you know, in this endeavor of knowledge creation. Um, my, my concern over APC is just uh, continues to, to mount, you know? So thinking of our open access agreement with Wiley, taking that one as an example, um, you know, we're trying to get more sophisticated with our, with our publishing projections there, but in any given year, that thing can bounce around drastically. So even if we were to control cost on APCs, if we were to have what I would consider a more reasonable APC of let's say $1,700 instead of 3,000, which is what we're averaging with Wiley. If publishing output goes up 50% in a year, you know, that volume right there will, will make this thing not sustainable. And there is every incentive for publishers to increase the volume, right? And I feel like publishers are getting more sophisticated with the cascading. I feel like they're putting in place a regime where an article that comes across the threshold will never escape. And so these volumes are going to go up across the board. It's not just that any particular publisher is going to get a bigger piece of the pie. That pie is going to grow. And I think that we need to wrestle with this because it's, it's not going to be sustainable. I'm a huge fan of subscribed open. I really like what Scott Delman has done at ACM. I think these non-APC approaches are more equitable and I think they have a greater opportunity to control cost going forward. Um, we have a lot to talk about in this area, I believe. Thank I just, you. I, oh, go uh, ahead. Uh, sorry, I was gonna say that, you know, if you 
um, if everything becomes open and, and as you say, more and more, uh, there are more and more outputs, more and more published articles and there's other types of outputs out there. It's funny how you can come right around the circle and need a subscription-based project uh, you know, program in order to help people find the material that's most important to them at the end. So um, it, it does end up becoming circular to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I, just to echo what Curtis said there, I mean, I, it is a great concern, I think, the, the, the emphasis on volume, because once you tie volume to dollars, you know, there is an incentive to grow volume, you know, whether that's launching new journals, and God, we need new journals like we need, well, whatever the analogy is, you know what I'm saying. Um, and, I, and it's certainly the case that, that the big commercial publishers who are looking after the, uh, looking after societies, are basically now driving them to accept more articles to turn the handle faster and faster and generate all this extra income. And, uh, you know, that's not really necessarily in the benefit of the academy and the societies don't always want to do it either. But they're being kind of told that that's what they've got to do because that's the way the model works. Okay, Robin, next question. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we've been kind of talking through some of the questions as they've come up because they're all about parts of what people are talking about. But I think I'm going to try to get the panel to talk a little bit more closely about the RRS, the rights retention strategy, and the, re the need for the author to retain copyright in moving to an open world rather than the publisher and how much pressure is this this was actually an earlier question for curtis that said you said something like you are hopeful that the rrs will further the transition to oa publishing by putting pressure on the system can you say more about your theory of change here what pressure does the rights retention strategy put on publishers to flip to oa and there's been a lot of other questions around that so we'll use that as a kickoff. Sure. And I, you know, just to, to qualify this answer again, you know, all societies are not created equal. So these things have, you know, uh, different impacts across different types of society. So some, I think, will be threatened by something. Why did 60, you know, publishers and societies, you know, sign that STM letter, right? It says in the letter that it's going to uh, negatively impact potentially income, right? I think if they're feeling financially threatened, they might feel motivated to move quicker toward open access. And I'll just, one other thing I'll say about that letter, what stood out to me about that letter that came out in February is yeah, there's 60 publishers, but compare that list of publishers against the folks who signed on to the White House letter the year before that. We had 120, 130 publishers signed on to the letter asking the White House, whatever, not to move on a zero embargo policy. And, you know, you had ACM, you had a whole bunch of societies and publishers that signed on to one, but not the other. And I don't know what that says, but to me, my takeaway is that there's probably some societies that are maybe fairly neutral about this. They didn't feel strong enough to sign on to the STM letter. So maybe it won't be a huge motivator to them. Maybe they just won't see it's gonna have much of an impact on their operation. I think the potential for funder mandates coming through are driving the change we're seeing right now. And so more funder mandates means more uncertainty, more urgency, and I think ultimately more movement. So maybe if I could pick up on, it was a comment that's gone through in the chat as well, but it relates to this as well. And that was, why did ACS launch nine new gold journals uh, pure gold journals at a time when do we need more journals, essentially? Can you not transition the existing ones? And the real answer there was, no, we could not transition those existing ones at the pace that Coalition S was setting out. So what is it, three or four year transition plan? When regions of the world are not moving at the same pace as Europe and then parts of America, we have to make sure that we do everything in a sustainable way that we can keep the quality standards up. So the existing journals could not transition fast enough back. So therefore we had to launch new journals so we could support the European community who would otherwise have had almost no journals to go to. So that was the, the motivator to launch new journals there. Plus it's good to, to have pure open access journals. There's a factor there too. So 
really coming full circle, that's basically saying the direction of Coalition S has helped migrate uh, publishers to launch new journals, to create solutions uh, that will be pure open access when the transition period for Coalition S ends. But unfortunately, other parts of the world are not keeping that pace up uh, and it's natural. So uh, we're doing all we can to encourage open access uptake in, in China, in America and other countries. But uh, yeah, it, it's not one size fits all going forward. We're not all marching at the same pace at this. Uh, so we have to try and keep all the wheels spinning, the plates spinning on the rack as we get from where we were five years ago to where we are now to where we'll be in five years time as well, while making sure that we can preserve the scientific record uh, for posterity too. Yeah, except I think probably what the what most researchers want is for the journals that they to publish in to be made open access rather than to be offered a new open access journal. So, I mean, you know, we won't be launching any new open access journals. My, my absolute priority is to try and transition the ones we've got that people have wanted to publish in for hundreds of years in our case to open access as soon as possible. Um, we, we, as I said before, we, we've had a zero embargo green policy for many, many years and we've never seen any detrimental effects from it. In 2018, when Plan S announced that they were going to require CC by licenses on an, on an article, on an accepted manuscript, we allowed that as well. So we added that to our policy, along with, I think, three or four publishers so far, not very many. And for the reason purely that we didn't want to lose authors from Plan S funders. So um, in our case, we had quite a lot of authors who were welcome funded, and we would, when Plan S kicked in, have just had to say goodbye to them had we not got because at that point we didn't have transformative deals, we had no other compliant route. So that's why I switched that option on. Um, we now have made some quite a lot of progress on making transformative deals, so we have another compliant route. Uh, we've also uh, had our journals accepted as transformative journals, so we've now got three legs under the table, if you like, for those authors. And my, that's my priority, is actually making sure that we don't have to say goodbye to any of our authors. You know, I just wanted to add real quick that I think this the conversation, you know, about rights retention and, and specifically about leaving copyright uh, with the authors, you know, I, I don't think that is a small point. And we talk a lot about access going from subscription to close, but you know, we 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 as librarians, we who are working with individual researchers, I think it's worth our time to spend more more time in conversation about what this shift in ownership means and that and that's really that's really important um and it's it's not to be uh it's not to be really taken lightly. And I, I think it sometimes can get brushed aside because the, the open access conversation is, is complicated. There's lots of different routes, there's business models. But if we talk about this real, who has ownership of those articles, um, but, you know, post, post publication, that's, that's, that's really a major point. And I just wanna put in a plug for continuing to have those conversations with our authors, um, rather if we are their publisher or if we are their, their librarian, that, that shift in ownership is, is really a huge, thing. Thank you. I'm going to take what AJ just put in the chat and kind of mush it in with something Brandon said earlier, which gets to the away from what what you were just talking about, which is individual articles being open and, and copyright and things like that. And someone, one, one of the society, I can't remember if it was Jim or Stewart who mentioned this earlier. All right. Do journals need to stay journals? Brandon had asked about consolidating journals, multiple journals into one, and then moving to a library publisher for those. AJ talks about overlay journals from like archive and things like that, and then moving those then peer reviewed and curated preprints, you know, now there's something different. They're more of a version of record, moving those to a library as publisher. Are, are we getting close to a point where, and, and of course this is all research based on researcher behavior, where journals won't be that thing you point at and say, all the good stuff is in that journal. Could it be that all that stuff is in that platform or all the good stuff is somewhere else are we are we getting there and will that help oa
Um, so I don't know if that's where everything is going, but I know we're we're working on some projects with our um, our preprint server Open Space Science Open Archive, uh, particularly around uh, these community science aspects I was speaking of at the beginning of uh, today's talk, uh, where we would have uh, lots of different types of material that are posted and tagged appropriately uh, just to be shared. Um, and uh, and then trying to connect people to well, what, what's gonna help uh, if I'm trying to replicate a project you did in your community, in my community, um, I can find that material. And along with that, there may be some peer reviewed aspects of that, some, some uh, traditional research that get pu gets pulled into a peer reviewed publication or, or something of that nature. And, I, and for us, uh, right now, it seems like if we're gonna do something like that, it will want to find funding, external sources of funding, um, not from authors, not from libraries, but, but uh, you know, maybe government or, uh, or some sort of charitable organizations that want to make this a reality. And I, I don't know if anybody else has any better ideas about how to, how to fund those sorts of operations, but I think it's possible. I was just going to add that the, from the question, I th what was going through my mind is this really opens the Pandora's box of researcher motivation to publish in journals, <laughs> full stop. And the way that credit is or uh, credit or recognition is provided by publishing in Nature or Nature Chemistry or JAX or whichever journal in the, the hierarchy you're talking about. So this is where there are many, many ways we could be creative and do things in a different style. But so if it doesn't satisfy researcher motivation and behavior changes very slowly in this world, uh, it's gonna be a really hard lift, but it is something that can be explored and looked forward to. But, uh, but just finding ways to uh, take things forward in a creative, transformative way, uh, yeah. There, there's options out there, but there are also barriers, which uh, that recognition side of things is the key here, that people just go straight to the journal and say, publish the journal in X, punch the air. You know, that's the, the bit that is a reality at the moment. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I think that's one of the big inhibitors of, of moving to newer systems. I mean, we've had journals for three and a half centuries, and, you know, they've been the solution for quite a lot of time necessarily the solution going forward but there is an enormous amount of inertia in the system from not the technology all exists for people to be able to share their research in much simpler ways frankly in more more, more um, efficient ways those things all exist but they're not being system which the credit system where Authors are rewarded for where they publish rather than what they publish, um, and that's that's a block currently, frankly. But this is also an area where I think we're seeing progress. So Brand had mentioned, you know, the work that's going on at HHMI. So if you look at the way that you know HHMI is evaluating who they're going to fund, you know. I don't even think they could put the you know journal impact factor anywhere near it. You know, it's a narrative CV. It's picking your five most impactful papers and making an argument about why they are impactful. And I think that's to me that's the work that really it would be nice to see the societies leading that, right? So you're connected with the researchers. You kind of define you know standards and practices within your disciplines you know and you really should be leading that i think and i think there's an opportunity to lead it and i would love to see all of you get the journal impact factor off of your own journal pages and you know stop marketing it we can't just wait for the researchers i think there's things you know across all of our different stakeholder groups that we could be doing on this front and you know thinking of from a library perspective, you know, what we've done, we brought DORA forward in our library. We're a signatory of DORA. We're a sponsor of DORA. We try and talk about DORA on our campus. You know, this is just something at every level we need to be pushing on. Thank you. I think I'll go back to another cost question now. I'm sorry to kind of, I feel like I'm making you think like your ping pong balls on a table costs, um, especially if we're thinking of the read and publish agreements, the transformative agreements where 
the cost for a library or an institution to support their researchers publishing with a particular publisher is based on article charges. How do you determine what it costs to actually produce an article? And are you sharing all of that information freely and openly? Are, are the libraries who enter into these agreements seeing the math at that level so that they know what's, what's up? Shall I make a start? I mean, on one hand, uh, we, we have our own accounts, so we know what our costs are. So that just like any organization, whether it's an airline or whether it's a university or whether it's a publisher, and we know what costs we are seeking to cover as part of the process. We also then overlay uh, differential costs so that, for instance, uh, where there's not a waiver, the lowest cost for an APC at, a at ACS is $250 for uh, papers from India going into ACS Omega. Uh, then we have the upper end cost, but it comes down if you're a member or you're a subscribing institute, so that you get to a different point. Those costs we we don't share, and very few businesses do share. You don't find out what the cost of an airline fuel is when you're flying a plane. You work out if that's where you want to go. And our antitrust advice is that we shouldn't be sharing that cost as, at this point. And we'll keep taking that advice to check where we can go on this because I know there's a big drive to try and uh, find out what what cost is for which part of the publishing process but if I get antitrust advice to say I shouldn't share it I follow that advice so that's where I am at the moment. Anyone else about publishing costs or a need to see costs? I'll quickly add, we try and have the transparency conversation with all of the publishers we're trying to do open access agreements with. And um, I think that's in the early stages of publishers being able to provide that information at the level that you know a library might be interested in. I think it's also like, it's a huge difference between if you think about like the transparency framework from the Fair Open Access Alliance, right? That one's pretty lightweight, six or seven or eight things. I haven't looked at it for a little while. And then you look at the the Plan S trans, uh, transparency framework, right? Which is on a spreadsheet with how many columns. It gets quite complicated. Even for a librarian trying to interpret that information, um, I think that's a conversation that could be had in the library community, I think, about what does transparency actually look like for us entering into these types of agreements? What do we need to know? What do we not need to know? I mean, we don't need to know everything, but some there are some key points, I think, that we could agree on. Um, and I think that's work that still needs to be done. Um, and I don't mean to undercut the, the Plan S transparency framework. It does make my eyes water a little bit when I look at it, though. I'll say I'm I'm for these sorts of transparency requirements. Uh, I I do think that when we at AG report our annual financial reports, it it gets a little bit uh, uh, confusing for those reading them about you know how much revenue is the publishing operation bringing in and how much is actually being spent. Uh, not all those expenditures show up in our publications department, um, and people get very confused about that. But I think that's on us to make it more clear. Any last thoughts on that question? Matt, can I ask you a real question, a, a quick question about the DORA? Like, is it, am I thinking of this right? Like that could be a conversation that AGU leads with your members, like research assessment reform is something that you empower a task force and you make recommendations and these folks take it back to their institutions and their departments. Like. Is that where that work needs to be done to get the buy-in from the researchers to take it back to the home institutions and reform? Because I know we've got departments that have lists, right? These are the these are the journals for P and T. You know, if you're not in there on these journals, it's like you're you're not going to have a career after, you know, five years. I I think part of the conversation can be led by AGU with its members, and we already, as I said, are signatories of DORA, uh, and have had those conversations, but not everybody 
um, you know, not everybody's always involved, even if they're invited uh, at the meeting to, to discuss these things. So it takes repetition and I think it takes cooperation, not just um, across AGU, but with other partners to help us move that forward. Uh, it is amazing um, how entrenched, uh, not just our own pet factor, but just the way uh, tenure and promotion works and, and what counts toward tenure and promotion and how entrenched that is. Um, and, and obviously uh, someone who's going up for tenure and promotion has to pay attention to that. Uh, so I don't think the conversation is only to be had at the society. Yeah, it's extremely frustrating, I think. I mean, it's I, I see this this is really the mother of all the problems. I mean, all these problems tend to flow down from this, this what I would consider pathological reliance on venue publication. And I, I think it, it's, it, it occurs at multiple points in the system. The people who are most subject to it are the early career researchers, and those are the people who are least able to really influence it. If they can't get off the merry-go-round. They have to play the game, unfortunately, to that extent. I think where the responsibility lies is with research performing institutions, with funders, with, dare I say, national academies like us, with learned societies. There has to be a concerted effort here to not simply sign up to DORA. We signed up to that several years ago. We took our impact factors off our web pages, but to go further than that and to actually make this change happen. So one of our functions is to is, is we have a science policy unit which is very active in advising policymakers and government. And we do have a strand which we're calling research culture, which looks at these sorts of things, how science actually works in practice, you know, how people are rewarded, how careers are developed and so on. I, I think it's absolutely critical that we solve that problem because once we do that, we will then, I think, unlock this very heavily journal dominated system and, and free up other ways of people sharing their scholarship. I think that's got to happen. Okay, we're down to the last three minutes. Um, any last statements, brief last statements from the panelists before we close? You know, I, I just wanna say, and I'm sure Curtis feels the same way as, uh, as uh, from the TSPOA group, but you know, I, I think webinars like this and any additional places and venues where we are having conversations um, with societies, uh, with libraries and societies at the same time, is a is a fantastic place. I, I think um, uh, you know an added element always should also be uh, researchers or faculty members who are members of those societies or pu publish with those society publications. So I, I just uh, you know thank you for having for having us, and I want to encourage more um, more of these conversations moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for participating. Really appreciate each of your perspectives. Um, the you, the um, video of this talk will be um, posted on YouTube. Uh, Robin and Devin, what's the name of the channel that it will be on? It's the Kopi channel. The Co Kopi YouTube channel. Okay. Um, and I will send out, when we have it, I will send out links to it to each of the panelists so you don't have to go looking for it. All right, I think we are set. Thank you all. It was a very stimulating conversation and clearly there's lots more to say about it. Um, Thanks for the invitation, great to be involved. Thank you. Okay, have a great day everyone and we are set. Okay, thank you.